I'm going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. This is an ant hill. Ants are what we call social insects. They live in communities. War and the Middle East. The two seem almost synonymous. Endless are the tales of Christians, Jews, and Muslims battling it out over what looks to many like nothing more than a strip of dry sand. But long before all that, there was a war like no other. Some 2,700 years ago, the greatest army in the world, the Assyrian army, marched out of what is today Iraq and made it to Jerusalem. On its way, it devastated everyone and everything in its path. Jerusalem was a relatively tiny city that now found itself surrounded by the greatest army in the world. And then, according to the Bible, something incredible happened, something miraculous. 185,000 Assyrians died mysteriously. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord had killed them. That's what the Bible has to say. But what does archaeology have to say about it? Most people don't walk around thinking about the Assyrians. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're different. Maybe you, do you ever think about the Assyrians? Uh, not really. No, not really, right? No. No. But something that happened with the Assyrians totally affects your life. Mm -hmm. And let me explain. They had Jerusalem surrounded. Yes. Then the Bible says there was a miracle. Yes. The next morning, people wake up. There's nobody there. They left, they ran away. You want to know how that affects your life? Yes. Had they won, had they defeated Jerusalem, do you realize what would have happened? There would have been no Judaism, no Christianity, no Islam. The whole world would be different. We wouldn't be sitting around here celebrating Hanukkah and Christmas. Yes. We'd be, I don't know, doing some Assyrian pagan thing. So what happened? In order to unravel this mystery, my journey begins in Israel, home of the only archaeology that can shed light on what actually occurred. Finding ancient archaeology is easy compared to making it through the traffic and, and into the old city. It's, it's <laughs> try to get to it. That's, that's the trick. And make it there and back. After a miraculous parking job, I meet with Dr. Gabi Barkai, an expert on the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. Okay, I'm just trying to understand what's going on here. Assyria is the big power of the time. Correct. The Assyrians are running out, pillaging and burning cities all around the country. And meanwhile, they're trying to get Jerusalem to surrender. Yes? It is true. Uh, 46 cities of Judah were destroyed, according to Sennacherib. Sennacherib? Why couldn't they get simpler names, these guys? Why did they have to get such complicated names? Because they names? were Assyrians. Uh, <laughs> So they, so had they Assyri have Assyrian names. In any case, uh, the Assyrians arrive to Jerusalem. They, so they show up here? They show up here and they built up their camp in order to besiege the city of Jerusalem. And the city of Jerusalem is awaiting uh, serious trouble. Many ants may be killed. It is a fight to the finish when two opposing soldiers meet. Hard jaw against jaw with no quarter asked, and none given. The Assyrians were led by their sadistic king, Sennacherib. Today, there are two artifacts that confirm the Assyrian campaign against Judah. The first is a relief carved in stone depicting Sennacherib's siege and destruction of Lachish. Interestingly, Tyrant Sennacherib's head is missing from most of the murals that survive today. The second significant artifact is Sennacherib's prism, an inscription on a triangular tablet, which describes in Sennacherib's own words how he treated his enemies. I cut off their lives like one cut string. My prancing steeds 
harnessed for riding, plunged into the streams of their blood as if into a river. Their testicles I cut off and tore out their penises like the seeds of cucumbers in June. I feel a strange sense of victory eating a falafel with cucumbers. Do you know that Sennacherib said that he's going to cut up his enemies like cucumbers? That's what he said. Yeah. A cucumber. <laughs> cool as a cucumber. <laughs> it never occurred to me until this moment. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was also the self-proclaimed king of the universe. And like many men looking to take over the world, his grand vision became a bit short-sighted. I'm Sennacherib, Sennacherib, king, king, the man, the Assyrian. I'm king of, king of, king of, king of the world. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn out. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. But if Sennacherib's army was that powerful, what exactly stopped him from destroying Jerusalem? I can thread a needle. I can go with this truck through a space that's half as wide as the truck. As it turns out, Jerusalem wasn't as weak as the history books might suggest. For a tiny kingdom, it did a pretty good job of resisting Sennacherib's attack. Carl Ehrlich is an archaeologist and historian. I managed to get his take on the story. So Sennacherib comes in, he decimates everything in his path. He's he a takes, he killing takes, machine. He's I mean. a killing, well, the Assyrian Empire is a killing machine. It's one of the ghastliest war machines of the ancient world. That being said, the stiff-necked people, these Judeans, did offer resistance. The Judeans were led by King Hezekiah, who after consulting the prophet Isaiah, decided to stand up to the Assyrians. Although he wasn't much of a military man, Hezekiah is now ranked with David and Solomon as one of the greatest kings to have ever ruled Jerusalem. Hezekiah got prepared. Jerusalem was well fortified, well reinforced for uh, withstanding a long siege. This is crazy. If you're an Assyrian and say, this little, little people with this little city, suddenly they think they can take on the whole empire. This is nuts, right? I wouldn't say that. If you're an Assyrian, I'm saying. They're, they're surrounding Jerusalem. Yep, yep. It doesn't look good. It does not look good at all. The Bible says something miraculous happened. Some supernatural, extraordinary event that took place in Jerusalem while the Assyrians were besieging Jerusalem. Now, what was it? What was it? This is what the Bible says. And the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were dead bodies everywhere. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Uh, the Bible mentions even a number. 185,000 people were found killed there. Lord's angel comes at night yeah. and smites 185,000 Assyrians. Yeah, I think the number is over-exaggerated. You think it's only 183,000? I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't there, but uh, the number does not convince one to be a historical figure. What would you think it is? I don't know. So uh, the story about the Lord's angel, it is for those who would believe the miraculous nature. And, yeah, you'd think it's uh, a heavenly intervention too if some guys had I you. Ha it. No, no, if some guys had your house surrounded uh, and they were about to get you and suddenly they had, you know, I stomach cramps, you, you'd think, listen, and they ran I, away on their motorcycle. I witnessed the Six Days War in Jerusalem here. And I believe in, uh, in miracles. I believe in a heavenly intervention and it's okay with me. Make yourself invisible. Oh, I almost forgot. In our modern world, the miracle theory has lost its power. For most scholars, the angel of God has been replaced by a number of other theories that often fail to explain what happened to that many soldiers. We have a, an extra biblical source, Herodotus, a uh, Greek historian who tells us that 
On the way of the Assyrian army from uh, Egypt, he says, uh, the army was attacked by uh, desert mice. Herodotus says an yeah. army of mice defeated the Assyrians? Yeah. Who ate up all the uh, military uh, equipment and the leather uh, components of uh, the military equipment and neutralize the uh, Syrian army. It's yeah. like the nutcracker suite. Uh, yeah. Another theory asserts that a plague broke out and ravaged the Assyrian army. But the enemy in this case is not big soldiers. This invading army is so tiny that it can be seen only through a microscope. Its soldiers are the germs of communicable disease. But the idea that an army of mice, or even a plague, killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers doesn't wash with Henry Aubin, a Montreal newspaper reporter. I met with him in Toronto to talk about his controversial book, The Rescue of Jerusalem. We know that the epidemic theory is, is nonsense. We know uh, there's... Well, why do we know that? Because, A, why wouldn't the Hebrews have been afflicted by this, as well as the Assyrians? B, we know that the, the, the Bible says that God did intervene by way of epidemic in other situations. For example, the most fam famous one is Passover. Why would the Bible not say that disease was the cause in 701 at Jerusalem? While trying to find adventure stories to read to his adopted African son, Aben became discouraged by the lack of black heroes in popular history. There were no comparable books on African historical heroes. So my wife suggested, why don't you look uh, on books for adults on African history and try to draw from those books some uh, bedtime stories. He eventually came across the 25th dynasty of pharaohs when a Nubian Kushite prince, an African prince named Taharqa, ruled ancient Egypt. It's here that Aubin stumbled across what he thinks is the only plausible explanation for what really happened at the gates of Jerusalem. Montreal reporter Henry Aubin has uncovered strong evidence that an African Kushite army intervened in the siege of 701 BC, scaring off the Assyrians and saving Jerusalem from destruction. He tells me that the strongest support for his theory comes from the Bible. The Bible is probably the best source. It's the uh, deliverance of Jerusalem is described in three different books, Second Chronicles, uh, Second Kings, and the book of Isaiah. Two of those three accounts uh, describe the advance of the Kushites trying to liberate Jerusalem from the siege, and then the Kushites vanish from the scene, and it's an angel of the Lord who slays exactly 185,000. But Aubin's Kushite theory is new and controversial. The Bible is not meant to be history, it's a theological a uh, representation of historical events, and it is meant to show us the uh, power of the Almighty within the history of the Israelites. Aben believes that to account for the glory of God's miraculous intervention, 26 chapters of theological text were at some point inserted into the Bible. By simply removing these later editions, the Kushite intervention becomes clear. So if you take out these 26 verses, what you have is Daharka is advancing. Next verse, Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor, says, well, let's withdraw on the double. If you ignore the, the theological insertion, then you have the Kushites a cause and effect Syrians hear the report of Taharqa's advancing army. Next sentence, they leave. They left, they ran away. Why did they do it? Good question. One theory is, by a Canadian guy, is that an African army was coming to the rescue of Jerusalem. Yes. And this 
black African army rescued Jerusalem just by starting to march. The Assyrians got scared, ran away, and you know, Jerusalem and the entire Western civilization was saved by this one African prince. Yes. Hmm. Interesting? Very interesting. Yes. What do you think of Oban's, Henry Oban's theory? I think he ultimately comes to the conclusion that it was the Kushite intervention in and of itself that saved Jerusalem. The Hebrews uh, were not passive recipients of this help from the Kushites. The, 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 the Hebrews uh, did some heroism themselves. A, they held out. They knew the Kushites were coming because they were allies. And they held out against this siege for as long as they could. And they also helped themselves by digging these, this very ambitious uh, waterworks to carry water under the city of Jerusalem, Hezekiah's tunnel. Get ready for the Jubilee, hurrah, hurrah. The remains of Hezekiah's tunnel are located in the West Bank in a fairly bad neighborhood, but we brought along our own security, so hopefully there won't be any problems. Can I make it in there? Yes. So you'll see it's a miracle because uh, the car is uh, bigger then the space. Okay, now let's see how badly I scratched the car. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. Well. It's here at the Gion Spring, just outside the city walls, that Jerusalem located its only source of water. When King Hezekiah found out that the Assyrians were advancing, he had to act fast. So he completed a tunnel 1,750 meters long that gave the people of Jerusalem secret access to the water. Water outside of the city of Jerusalem had to be brought into the city of Jerusalem. So while the Assyrians were dying of thirst up above, the city of Jerusalem had all the water it needed. How did he do it? He, they coordinated teams of engineers, some digging from the outside, some digging from the inside, and they did what often people digging tunnels today can't do, and that is they met somewhere in the middle. So basically, you read in the Bible something, and you come over here, you dig, and there's actual archaeological corroboration of the biblical story. This is one of the best examples for that. You have the story here becoming yeah. alive, emerging out of the rocks of Jerusalem. Uh, this place, the Spring of Gihon, is a key point to understanding the uh, political and military problems of King Hezekiah. Just think about the king standing here, thinking to himself uh, how the Assyrians would uh, divert the water or poison the water and how the people inside the city of Jerusalem during the siege would die of thirst. I think the Assyrians, the Assyrians are coming again. No, it's the Israelite army. It's okay, we're safe. We're, what's going on, we're stuck in a very bad area of the West Bank here and uh, our security guys have locked us out of the car. Hezekiah's tunnel is real archaeological evidence of the siege of Jerusalem. But it still doesn't explain what happened to 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. If the Kushites did have something to do with Jerusalem's rescue, why does all the popular scholarship ignore them? Why don't the history books even mention the possibility of this African intervention? Henry Aubin thinks the reason the Kushite army has been excluded from popular biblical scholarship has less to do with history and more to do with prejudice. Why are the Kushites expunged from this account? The, the reason would have been when, when the chosen people are divinely rescued, it really has to be by the divinity, by, by Yahweh himself. So Yahweh intervenes directly. It can't be through a human agent. That would be the primary reason. So you're saying, the Kushites rescued Jerusalem, but the Bible says God did it. Yes. Aben thinks that the reason scholars haven't gone with the Kushite intervention theory stems from racism and its effect on biblical academia ever since European colonialism reached its height in the 18th century. Society today has this view of Africa as being incapable of pulling off any such feat. Assyria had such a huge army. I mean, it was seen as invincible at that time. How could an African army repel such, such a force? It boggles the mind. 
We think of Africa as grass huts and drums. We don't see it for what it was. Aubin says, the bias against Africans is a relatively recent development in biblical scholarship. At the time that the Bible was written, this racism didn't exist. In fact, the Kushites were highly regarded and mentioned quite often in the Bible in a very positive light. During the, 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 the flight from Egypt to uh, the Promised Land, uh, Moses marries a Kushite woman. In Isaiah uh, chapter 18, verse 7, you have the Kushites uh, being capable of coming to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh, worshiping God, the God of the Hebrews. The Kushites are actually the most praised of all foreign peoples mentioned in the Bible. He makes a strong case that the idea that at a time when really the Assyrians were crushing everybody right, left, and center, a Hebrew-African alliance seems to thwart the greatest military uh, might, that there's good reason why in a very biased atmosphere of a couple of centuries of biased scholarship that would be ignored. I, I think he does a great job there in showing that scholarship is not as unbiased as all that and that it's quite possible that the Kushites and a Kushite advance played an important role. But I don't think that even with his arguments that that is the sole factor. Do we know how successful they were? Do we know what the extent of their intervention here was? Uh, are we able to claim unequivocally that there were Kushite armies that moved into the region? No, we aren't. We're here in the realm of speculation. It's quite possible, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the way it was. Couldn't it be a combination? Here they are, they're having a tough go of the siege, a plague breaks out, and then Sennacherib wakes up in the morning and not only does he have a shortage of water, tough Judeans that are totally religiously crazy and think God is going to save them. And he's got a plague in his camp on top of it. And then he gets word that these Nubians are marching towards him. It, couldn't it be a combination of exactly what the Bible says? Look, uh, in every matchmaking, in every marriage, and in every divorce, there is not one reason which brings that couple together and not one single reason which causes them to get apart. In life, it is usually a combination of reasons. So what happened? Well, on one level, we know what happened. Jerusalem was saved. And because Jerusalem was saved, so was Judaism. And that allowed for Christianity to be born and Islam to be born. So what saved Jerusalem? Well, maybe it was a plague. Maybe it was an army of rats. Maybe it was the threat of the incoming Kushites that made the Assyrians run away. But whatever happened, the ancients wouldn't have differentiated and wouldn't have cared. They would have seen it as a miracle.